Okay, I think we're ready. Uh, what we're doing today is looking at a photoresistor, which we've got right here. Uh, we'll put it basically in the exact same circuit that we put mm -hmm. the thermistor in. Um, we will do a, get a bit of statistics, so some uh, just some terminology, what different things are called and why they're called different things. Um, and then we'll look at the normal distribution. That's the one that you're most familiar with. It looks like the bell shape. Now, there's a lot that look like a bell shape, but we'll look at the Gaussian distribution that's sometimes called the normal distribution. And then we'll look at one that's uh, got an odd name. If you watched one of the podcasts earlier about uh, Guinness, then this one's name was explained there on why it's called the student distribution or the student T distribution. So we'll look at that also. Um, let's start with our tool for today. Let's get this out of the way. Today we're looking at um, a feeler gauge. Now there's not a whole lot we can look at that. It's just a, a stack of little feelers or blades. Sometimes they're called blades. Um, and they're different thicknesses. So you got really thin and then they get to thicker, they're still pretty thin. Um, like this one is uh, 0.02 inches, this one's 0.005 inches. So you use these when you're trying to measure the uh, space between two items. A lot of times this would be something that you would use to set the valve lash on a engine, uh, things like that. Sometimes I use them um, if I want to get a particular height on my printer um, between the nozzle and the print bed. You know, I might go to the, uh, they also have metric measurements in here. so. A lot of times maybe this 0.178 is in the right range or even the 0.127 if I want to be a little closer um, you could use it to do that um, there there's nothing tricky about them except that um, it does take some skill I guess or maybe experience maybe experience is a better word to the skill because there's not that much skill to it um, because it's relatively easy to force these are like a steel a hardened steel um, like maybe a spring steel. Um, it's relatively easy to force maybe too thick of a feeler gauge in between two objects, particularly if there's some compliance between the two. So like on a printer, um, you would have the bed is a lot of times supported by springs and so it has a, some give to it. So you can, you can force a larger uh, feeler between the things that you're trying to measure the gap between than necessary. So it does take some feel on how uh, how much drag you should have a good way to or a way I don't know if it's a good way a way to tell if you're feeling the right amount of drag is maybe just take a sheet of paper and uh, get I don't know maybe four or five five to ten sheets of paper and put the sheet that you I don't know if you can see the different colors of sheets here maybe we'll, we'll make a mark on this one this will be our feeler that one Put it between now these are clamped down in a, a binder over here so you know and just shove one but underneath five and maybe over another sheet of paper and maybe that kind of drag is what you're looking for um, maybe a little bit more but you don't want a lot the, the purpose isn't to how you know how big of a feeler gauge can you force between two objects or or how small of one can you get there you want just the right amount you want to measure the actual gap without inducing any kind of deformation in the system. And so about that kind of drag is what you're looking for. Uh, a sheet of paper, these are just regular printer paper, underneath five or 10 sheets of paper, the weight of those. Now you do have to hold them down. If you don't have a binder, you have to hold this other side down. Otherwise it's gonna drag it all around. Um, but something like that, that's what you're going for, that kind of uh, drag. If you, if you put too heavy a load on top of it, um, you'll notice that um, for one it can't move and you might be able to pull it out well I got too much there might be able to pull it out but you couldn't push it back in without it buckling up definitely too much drag there um, same thing with a gauge a lot of times on these gauges you even now these they're not all uh, at an angle like this some sometimes they're just straight um, these are particularly made for getting under um, in a, a rocker arm in a engine so that you could measure the gap between the rocker arm and the spring well the valve stem that it's riding on or that it's pushing up and down and so you're trying to get and so a lot of times you'll come from the side like this so you're not even getting that buckling effect you'll just come from the side and try to get the right amount of gap between there so that's that's just a tool for measuring um, 
it's not necessarily for you could use it to measure you know a lot of times this particular type of tool is used to set something at a particular gap um, so that's a form of measuring but um, you don't necessarily use it to measure the gap you can um, a lot of times it's used to set that gap between two objects all right so feeler gauges uh, feeler blades sometimes they're also called um, I think most of the time I've ever seen them they were feeler gauges and they just come in a little pack and they have metric and imperial units uh, I don't know if those are laser etched or how they're actually on there uh, but they're on there somehow so that you know what you're measuring <clears throat> they do or my set I don't know maybe they do make a set um, don't come with a certificate of certification that this is exactly the width that you're measuring or the thickness you're measuring all right so that's a uh, tool that you might have used before Matt not at least now you know they exist if you ever need to uh, measure the gap between something that's what you use all right so let's start on our statistics introduction um, we're just going to start with some things that you probably already know uh, some of them certainly you already know um, but uh, then there's some that are like there's a little so subtle differences that make a big difference in the end so we need to make sure we have the words right uh, so that we can do some other things later uh, with the correct words and terms and the correct measurements so just an introduction to statistics not to be confused with statics all right so one thing is population so a lot of times we'll, we'll talk about was well, that the population standard deviation or the population mean um, or is it a sample the other term you'll hear in this same idea is sample so population is all the things so every you know every uh, student that takes an ex that particular exam it's it's every one of them um, or it, you know it's these populations are usually really large sets of data um, and a lot of times you can't even collect information from the entire population um, like the population is too large all of the five-year-olds in the world you know you can't get all of that data so um, a lot of times the population is we either have to estimate it or we have to do a very large sample to, to work with a sample is just a subset of the population so it's the it's the group that you can actually reach right um, you have to be careful with the sample uh, because we could easily uh, bias the sample in a way that it didn't really represent the population so you could you could be thinking of um, scores on a particular exam and only sample groups that uh, had studied for that exam you know and so you uh, you may want to do that but if you weren't intended to do that if you were trying to get some average score then uh, that would not represent the whole population that would represent a very specific subset of that population so you have to be careful when you're building your sample uh, that you either you are intentionally biasing it to see is this group this subset different from this other subset that might be a reason to, to specifically bias the samples but if you want a, a sample that represents the entire population um, you have to be careful about that you you'll see all sorts of polls here in the next weeks where well, we've been seeing a lot of polls and uh, you have to be careful are, are those polls being biased one way or another are they telling me what I uh, you know the correct information so samples are important um, the random variable this is just the word for what it is that you're measuring um, there there are two types of random variable discrete random variable and continuous random variables so a discrete random variable only exists in certain states so a coin I don't I don't think I have a coin up here anywhere um, normally there's one sitting somewhere but you know what a coin is so a coin if you flip a coin it really only has heads or tails you know there's the really random off chance that it lands on the edge but even then there's still only three uh, options except I guess you could think of the edge as maybe infinitely 
uh, you know, it could land on any point on the edge. So maybe that was, it's not going to happen. So it's going to land on the top, the head, or the tail side. Um, so it has two discrete options or a, or a die, you know, a six sided die. Uh, it's going to land on one of those six sided, six sides. Um, so that's a discrete random variable. It has specific states that it can exist in. Continuous one um, uh, is not that way. It could have many, many different, infinitely many uh, states of values. Uh, and so those are two different kinds of uh, random variables, ones that end in specific uh, states and ones that don't, like the light bulb burns out after so many hours. There's infinitely many number of hours that it could be when you get down to more and more decimal points. Um, we have these distribution functions. There are a lot of different ones. We pretend to stick with the Gaussian distribution or the, um, the bell curve or the normal distribution. Those are all kind of names that we use for the same thing that I guess maybe more technically would be the Gaussian distribution uh, would be uh, the correct name. But um, there are other names that we often use. Normal distribution also is correct. Bell curve is not quite correct because there are a lot of things that look like the bell curve, but they're not normal distribution and they're not Gaussian distribution. Um, but this is talking about how is our data, if we were to plot a histogram of it. So a histogram is a frequency plot that shows the number of occurrences of a particular data point in the entire sample. Um, and so you can have some that, uh, let's draw a couple here. This is just my x-axis, so we can draw a couple of different distributions on it. So the, the Gaussian one kind of looks like this. There's the bell, and you've got this central, whoa, that's a crooked line, the center part, and there should be an equal side on either one. Um, maybe you have one that's skewed, and it's not equal on either side. You could have the mirror image of that one also. Um, you could have one that is bimodal. It has two uh central tendencies you know it, it maybe there's a clump of data over here and a clump of data over here um, so these distribution functions are um, each one has its own purpose and own name and they describe different uh, tendencies for the data we're going to stick with the normal distribution for the stuff that we're going to do um, probability this is exactly what you would think it is it's the probability that something is going to occur. Uh, and so a lot of times we'll use a capital P for that um, for, to represent probability. Sometimes you'll see P with uh, uh, a hyphen or not a hyphen, an apostrophe next to it, like the prime symbol. That'll be the uh, opposite of the probability. So it's the, uh, I guess, I don't know if it has a technical name or not. I'm sure it does. I just don't know what it is. Uh, but it's the other side of the probability. So P equals zero means that not going to happen. There's no chance that whatever this is is going to happen. And P equals 1 is it's sure to happen. Now, these don't typically occur, right? 0 and 1. Somewhere you're, you're usually in the midst of 0 and 1. So um, that's the range, though. Uh, 0 is the thing is not going to happen at all. And one is that it is sure to happen. It is the thing that's going to happen whenever you do this particular set of events. But normally you're somewhere in between there. Um, and so the probability is between zero and one for most things. Um, so you might, you might do things like um, if you had a, um, let's see which one I'm going to want to do. Uh, a die. We'll do a die. So a six-sided die. So it's got the numbers one through six on it. And you want to write some equation in this form with probability that um, two things are mutually exclusive. So um, they can't occur at the same time. So if you're rolling a single die, 
um, you couldn't roll a three and a four. So you could roll a three or a four, but you can't roll a three and a four on the same die, unless it's a very odd die. Um, so if you were trying to describe that, you would have the probability of A or B, and there are some symbols. We're gonna use words right now so that we don't uh, get confused on what the symbols mean. So the probability of A or B, so A is maybe a three, and B is rolling a four. They can't both happen if you only have one die. Um, that probability would equal the probability of whatever event A is rolling a three, plus the probability of B. And so if you think about that, the probability or the chance that you're gonna roll an A, which is a three, so that's one, one option on a six-sided die, so one out of six, plus the probability of rolling a B, which is a four. Also, there's only one four on a D6 normally. So you'd have one six plus one six, uh, and you could uh, get that that's uh, two sixths or a third. There's a one third chance that you're going to roll a three or a four if you take and roll a single die. Um, now that's different. This changes if suddenly um, you're rolling two die, and you want to roll a three or a four on one of them. Uh, then the probability would not work this way because you could roll a three or a four on the first one, you could roll a three or a four on the second one, and so you have more chances that you would roll a three or a four. Um, and so it's uh, you do have to know are the, the events that you're testing the prob probability of, are they mutually exclusive, meaning that um, if one occurs, then the others can't occur, or are they not exclusive? So if I have two dice, then yeah, they could both have threes. They could both have fours. One could be three, one could be four. They could both be neither. Uh, so there could be lots of options there and it changes how you have to deal with the probability. Um, in the write-up, there's a uh, description of the birthday paradox. Um, that one's, I'm not gonna read that one to you. There's, it's pretty well described and it basically talks about what's the probability and how you would determine the probability of two people having the same birthday. And most, if you just think about that, your intuition is like, wow, there's like 365 days in the year, or if it's a leap year, there's 366 days. So um, there's not much chance that two people are gonna have the same birthday. Um, but once the group starts to get larger, I think it's like if the group gets to be about 50 people, it's almost guaranteed that at least one pair in there has the same birthday. Um, and that doesn't make sense, but uh, read through the description and uh, you can see how, well, yeah, that does, well, and that does make a couple of assumptions. It assumes that, um, well, it assumes, first of all, that we're not do it including leap years, um, which is a pretty decent assumption. And then it also assumes that birthdays are even well i guess not normally distributed but they're evenly distributed there's an equal chance of any particular day having the same number of birthdays on it that may or may not be true there probably are some days that uh have a larger birthday clump around them depending on different locations there's probably some reason that birthdays might clump like more more people are trying to have their children in the summertime maybe so they're not in school or I don't know. There's gonna be a lot of reasons why there might not be, that assumption might not be true. But still, it's probably close to true. Um, and then a lot of times that's what we have to do, right? We, uh, the statistics, there is a lot of math involved and a lot of rigor and a lot of equations that look really complicated, but at the same time, there's a lot of like figuring out, well, is that close enough to true to work for me? Uh, so I can make this assumption for to do all the rest of the rigorous part of it. Um, and so that's a, that's a little trick of st statistics that just takes time to deal with. Now, fortunately for us, we're doing statistics that are going to be based on a measurement. It still does require some assumptions sometimes, um, but it's not as broad of an assumption like assuming that uh, birthdays are evenly distributed throughout the year. Um, we, we get a little more control over that when we're measuring. Also, if you're designing a measurement system or a measurement process, then you can build in that control, right? Um, and that's another part of the 
engineer's job if you're building a measurement or a control system is to build in that kind of uh, st that state where you don't have to make these assumptions. You, you've built them in to the whole system. Um, here are some other terms. Um, we'll, we'll, this isn't your only introduction to uh, probability. We'll actually gradually introduce things. So right now we're just talking about terms. Um, you don't have to think that this is all you have to know and or that's the only explanation you're going to get. Um, measure of central tendency. So these are all words that you'll hear when you're relate, talking about statistics. So measure of central tendency will be one of those me uh, terms. Um, you might remember back in when you started calculus, you saw the uh, central limit theorem and things like that. Eventually, you'll start to see a lot of these things are um, related to one another. And so they share some terms and they share some ideas. Um, and you'll, you'll start to put it all together. You just have to see a bunch of it before you can put it all together. Um, measure of central tendency. So the when we're describing these shapes you know one of the things that we can easily talk about is well where's the the center of this thing at or the central tendency uh, for this data to occur and the easiest one is x bar which is the mean which a lot of times we call the average um, but we're going to call it the mean now um, this is the mean when we do x bar this is the mean of a sample. So we've taken some number, we took 40 sample, 40 data points out of a huge giant population and that's the, this is the mean, you know how to calculate the mean, it really is how you calculate the average, there's nothing fancy. Um, you add them all up and divide by the total number. Um, a similar idea is mu and this is going to be the mean of the population. So it's slightly different. Um, if we were to write these two, let's finish out this. So if we were to write the equations for these out, we would have that the mean is what you already know. Summation of all the individual samples over the uh, total number of samples from i equals 1 to n. This one looks almost identical. Summation, i equals 1, uh, but we're going to use a capital N, still all the individual samples, and divided by a capital N. So the, the lowercase n and the capital N are showing the number of samples and the number of points in the population. So the all the data points that exist for that population. So lowercase is the sample, uppercase is the uh, population. Um, mean, so you know that one, you probably know this one also. Median, so if you take and take all your samples, so this is usually for a um, po uh, sample, not, not the population unless it's a very controlled population but you take all of them and you order them one way or the other, ascending or descending, it doesn't matter, but you order them and uh, you've picked the middle one. So not the average anymore, uh, but just the one that lands in the middle. There's an equal number on one side, an equal number on the other side. So maybe if there's not a middle, you have to, um, you have to take the average of the two points that are in the middle. It depends on if you have an odd or even number of data points, right? But this is just the one in the middle after it's been ordered. So the middle data point of an ordered, uh, maybe sorted would be better, a sorted list of data points. Um, they do have to be lined up ascending or descending though, otherwise it's just random and it makes no sense to pick the middle. Mode, you know that one. 
It's the, the single data point that occurs, the, the value, not the data point, but the value that occurs most often. So um, when you have data that is norm evenly distributed like this, a lot of times the, the mean or, or normally distributed, the, the mean will tell you a good bit about it, but it doesn't necessarily tell you everything. And so other simple things like how, which one occurs the most often, maybe that's useful. Um, median kind of gets rid of the idea that there could be some outliers, right? You, sh you could have some data points, like you could have, if we had a set of data, remember we drew a line and some data points on it. And you collect a data point, you collect a whole bunch of them over here. And you collect one way over here somewhere. Then this one has a, a decent effect on the mean, right? It, it pulls the average of these a good bit further than what it really is. But it doesn't really affect the median. So when you have mean and median together, you can kind of get rid of these outliers, right? Um, so this one over here, the median is, you know, it's affected a little bit. Instead of choosing this one, you choose this one, right? It moves it over one, but, uh, it, the median will eliminate some of these outliers, uh, where the mean would actually include this and the average of this plus this one, you know, it's maybe somewhere over in here instead of over here where you expect it to be. Um, so that's why you might want to use median mode. Um, it's not as useful at least. Uh, in my mind, but uh, it's just the one that happens the most. Now, if you also had information about how much more often that one happened, then that, that would be useful. Like if you have one data point that occurs 50 times and everything else occurs at most four or five times, then yes, that's a useful piece of information. Um, all right. Another term in statistics is dispersion. We don't usually use dispersion. We call it other things. I'm off the screen. I think so. There we go. Um, so a lot of times what we call dispersion is deviation. You've heard standard deviation. And um, I don't know if I used the word deviation when we did our linear regression and I drew the line to go through different data points. There was a deviation between a data point and the line that I drew, right? Um, so deviation is just that it's a, a, a distance between uh, a data point and maybe the mean, you know, the sample mean. So if we had D for deviation, the deviation of point I would equal that point's value subtracted from the mean. And I guess you would have to deal with some of these would be positive, right? And some of them would be negative, which we normally don't like, because if I have a bunch of positive ones and I add them to a bunch of negative ones when I sum up the deviations then they would just cancel each other out um, so instead what we usually talk instead of just plain deviation we standardize it and we call to talk about the standard deviation and that's s again we're going to have um, population standard deviations and sample standard deviations. So right now the S is going to be for a sample. So a sample standard deviation, the equation would be instead of just subtracting uh, each individual deviation from the mean, we'll still do that, but we'll square it. Mm -hmm. So that now we have, instead of some negatives and some positive, we have all positive numbers, but now that's larger than it needs to be. So we're going to divide it. Now, we're going to divide it by n minus 1. Remember, n is the sample size. So you might think you divide by n. There's a really long explanation that I, I don't even know how to explain myself. So when you're calculating the standard deviation, it's going to be divided by n minus 1, not just the number of samples. So it's actually one less. So this is usually referred to as the degrees of freedom of a set is uh, the number of 
data points minus one. So n minus one instead of just n. And then we're going to add all this up. But since we squared it over here to get it back down to what we expect, we're going to take the square root. So that would be the standard deviation. And for s, that's going to be of a sample. You do have a population standard deviation that looks similar. Um, we call it, we use sigma for that lowercase sigma. And we still have to do the same process. We're going to sum the individual data points distance from instead of we're doing population. So sample mean was X bar population mean was mu. We're going to square that. And then for this one, we don't subtract one. We just divide by the entire population number in. Um, so this one is for population. So what this does, this is telling us about the deviation that any individual data point has from the mean of the data point. So if we were to draw pictures of this and assuming we have a normal distribution. So let's assume we have a normal distribution. Let's just draw a big picture. So our normal distribution is where you have a mean and there's equal amount of data on either side. So let's put a, this is our X bar or our mu, whichever, if you're doing population or sample. sample. Um, so this would have, let's say that this has just a standard deviation of one. Let's just make a number one. Um, if we had another set that had the same average, but a smaller standard deviation. So this distance between the data points and the mean, well, we're doing a sample, I guess, because I wrote X bar data point and the mean is a smaller number overall. That means things are clumped closer to the X bar and You know, we might get a higher peak, more things are around the center and it's squished together. This would be a lower standard deviation. We'll call it this one S equals one. And then if we had one where it's a higher standard deviation, that means the, the distance, the average distance between an individual data point and the mean is a bigger number. So that's going to spread things out. And so we would have something like this. Higher standard deviation than my one. One is just a random number I picked. Uh, so standard deviation isn't always one. It's not normalized. It's all kinds of different numbers. <clears throat> um, these are like histograms, right? So a histogram is a frequency plot. And um, I'm not going to go in how to build a histogram. Um, you, you do need to know what a histogram looks like. I assume you do. If you don't know what histograms are, then um, maybe, maybe ask a question and we'll put a separate thing about histograms. But I assume that most people have a decent idea of what a histogram is going to look like. And, well, we could, we could do one thing. We could try and, uh, we can try and make a, uh, histogram in Python. We could do that. I think I have some data we can use some exam grade data or made up exam grade data. I don't think it's real data. Um, let's see, let's get Thonny up and run in. There's Thonny. All right. Let's make a new piece of code here. Um, I have a, let's see, somewhere on the desktop, <laughs> wherever I put it. Let me see if I can find it real. Well, I know it. it's, it's just a file um, an, of a comma separated file. And I think I called it exam grades. We'll have to check and see. I think that's what I called the file name. Um, so all this is, is it's a file that has um, 
uh, a title at the top that says something like exam grades and then a column of individual exam grades and the and I saved it as a CSV so they should be uh, a comma separated file instead of a regular Excel file all right so I'm right here I'm just giving it a name hopefully that's the one I actually called it if not we'll get an error and I have to track it down but we'll figure it out um, we're going to import or we're going to make a plot so we're going to do a mat plot library uh, we only need the pie plot part of it so we've done that before import that library as plt um, Now, this part, I could have just written examgrades.csv in here, but uh, I guess we're being fancy and uh, we're using a variable to open this. Um, that's If you're ever going to do something more than once in a uh, piece of code, now this is going to be a pretty short code, but um, if you have longer code, it's nice to put variables up at the top so that if you don't have to go and track them down everywhere you might have written them in thousands of line of code so this is a good practice to use in this case it's maybe a little overkill because uh we're not really doing that much so we're going to read it in and going to remove any blank spaces that might be before or after the data that we actually want so anything that's blank will get stripped off we're going to split it up uh, into a variable called rows so that it's each data point. And the way it exists right now is uh, it's comma separated. So it's just a uh, number, comma, number, comma. Actually, the first thing is exam grades, I think, and then a bunch of numbers and commas. Um, so we're going to split this on, um, we're going to, I think it's going to work with a carriage return. So the slash in. So that each one's in a row um, when you when it was built in excel they were in rows so i think it, this will work okay um the i'd like i said that it did have a header at the top so we're going to pop the header off you can actually put other numbers in here it doesn't have to be zero um, you can pop anything out um, there is another uh, command that's called pop uh, that's more generic in data sets and it does talk about removing the top only but uh, this Python pop uh, you can put any index in here and pop out any particular one you want to so zero would be the very top row all right so we pop that thing out uh, let's get our data oops data equals we're gonna want an integer value So we're making a little loop here. Um, so one thing with a histogram, so Python probably does have um, a histogram. It does have, we, we, in fact, we used it, I think, very early on in the plotting thing. Or maybe we didn't use it, but I pointed it out. Um, it does have a histogram uh, function, right, in the matplot library. Uh, the one thing about it is, it doesn't automatically calculate the number of bins. So when you're building a histogram, you've got uh, to decide how how many different data points will fit within one set of ranges for these bins. Maybe we we'll draw a picture. So um, our histogram is going to look something like this. You know, I don't know what it'll actually look like, but there are all these little uh, bars that are maybe stacked up against one another or they have gaps between them that part's not important but the bars have a certain width right here so any data point that goes from uh, 0 to 1 we'll say uh, will fit in this bin and these are called bins and the next one maybe it has a bin range of 1 to 2 so anything from 1 to 2 will go in this one and 2 to 3 and so forth so all the bins need to be the same width in my case I made them a width of 1 um, and you don't want to have too many or too few bins. So um, we need to calculate how many bins do we have. So back over here, or do we need? What we're going to do is we're going to set up a variable just in. So how many pieces of data do we have? So lin here is the length 
of data. So it's not it's the uh, the number of data points that I have. Um, we could print that out if we wanted to. Actually, why don't we test this right now and make sure that I've got all this part working before we write the whole thing? Because um, this will print how many data points do I have if it works. We're gonna have to save it. Uh, my data, my file is on the desktop that exam grades file. So this will be histogram. All right, let's see if it. Okay, it did work. Um, so I did name it exam grades. Uh, you could put a path in here. Maybe if you really don't like keeping all your Python code and your um, data files on the desktop, you want to put them somewhere else. Um, you could just put them all in the same folder, but maybe you want to have code in one folder and data in another folder. Instead of this file name just being examgrades.csv, you could put a uh, path in here. So if you knew the default path, then you could say, well, from there you go to, you know, data, whatever, whatever, and, and you can actually put the path in there. I just am being simpler here and putting them all on the desktop. So, well, they only work in the way that I have it set up if they're in the same folder, in this case, the desktop. All right, so it did read it in and it said that we have 466 uh, data points. So, there are different ways to calculate the number of bins. Sometimes you just use uh, like a chart that shows you, hey, if you have more between this many and this many, then use this many bins. If you don't have a chart available, just take the square root. So let's see the square root of 466. Let's see what that is. Well, hold on. Get my calculator out. 21.58. So you can't have a 0.58 of a bin. Uh, so 21 is also odd. So let's just make it 20. So B is going to equal 20. So we could also code this in, you know, so that we put another exam of uh, grade CSV in here with a different amount of data in it. Uh, then we could go in and, and have this be um, the square root of that number and then round it to the nearest 10 or whatever. Um, but we just hard coded it in this time. All right, so let's make the plot or the histogram. So we have our number of bins here. We have our data uh, put into integer form. What this line did is, by default, it's uh, gonna it's gonna think the data is all text. And so all this does is it goes in for every R in rows. Rows is after well, right here we we took all our data and put it in rows. Um, it just turns it all into an integer. So it's all a number instead of a string. All right, so because you can't plot numbers, I mean you can't plot strings. We only need one plot, so one row, one column. Remember AX is just kind of the um, generic variable that a lot of times we use for plotting. So we have a figure with one subplot in it. We can make up a title. Um, this is exam grades. So, wow. Grades. Um, we could have X and Y labels. Let's see. The x-axis is going to be the exam grade itself, or let's put score just to have something else to write. So the grades, the y label, so the y-axis here is um, the, the frequency. So maybe the number of students with this grade, or you can just say frequency. frequency. Um, and then we actually never made the plot, did we? We just made a spot for the plot. Let's let's make it a plot. So it's going to be a histogram, and it's going to have the data set here, which is just the um, the integer values, but in rows, uh, and then bins equals b, which we hard coded in right here, which. You know, 
we should have probably not hard coded it in, but that's what we did. Oh wait, that's not the. Um, oh shoot, what is the comment for Python? Is the hashtag? There we go. All right, um, and we have to show the plot. Oops. All right, so I think mm -hmm. this will get us a little histogram. There it is. Um, now this one, um, and you could go in and edit that, you know, you can put borders around each of the lines, you can put spacing between them, all that kind of stuff, not important uh, for what we're doing here. But this would be a histogram. Now notice, um, it doesn't look like a normal distribution. So a lot of times, the very first thing that you want to do when you are um, about to analyze some data is to plot the data. You know, is it a histogram plot or a scatter plot or whatever? I don't know. It depends on what you're trying to do. But a histogram plot, if you're about to do some probability stuff, is probably where you should start. Um, and because you look at this and it's like, well, that's not really a Gaussian distribution. I've got, for one thing, I've got a little clump over here on the really low side of the grades. And then I've kind of got a central, you know, around 80, but it's tail, it's got a longer tail than it does over on this side. So it's not quite normally distributed, uh, distributed. Um, so you would have to decide, all right, so what's going on with this group? Do I just throw them out and do the analysis? Because if I try to put a bell curve or a Gaussian curve to match this, it's not going to match it very well. Uh, so if you wanted to work with probability on this particular data set, you probably wouldn't want to use the stuff that we're about to use with the uh, Gaussian distribution, normal distribution, because it's, it doesn't look like one. So being able to plot a histogram uh, is a pretty handy task or, or skill to be able to do uh, when you're about to do some kind of probability analysis. All right. See if there's any more that I want to say about. I think that's all that we want to say about statistics in as a broad sense, and then we'll start getting closer to probability and and the things that you might do with some of the statistics. Um, let's jump over to our uh, photoresistor real quick, so we can do something other than look at numbers and code for a little while. Um, let's get this out of the way. Uh, yeah, we'll come back to that. All right. So photoresistor. It's this little guy, or at least the ones that we have, is they look like this. There it is. You can actually even see um, it is a photoresistor. There are others that are like photodiodes um, that work in a similar way, but they do, they're, they're a little bit different. Um, this is a photoresistor. So there's actually um, a resistive element to this and if we see can oh we have to zoom out to see that let's see if we can get enough of this on at one time all right so i'm measuring this the resistance of the photoresistor right now and so it looks like it's around 2000 ohms 2200 ohms or something like that um if i cover it up and it doesn't get any light it goes much much higher so 12,000 ohms or so and it sees light, 2,000 ohms. If I had a way to make more light shine on it, I don't really know that I'd do, though. Um, then it would go even lower. Um, so the resistance of this uh, photoresistor changes with different amounts of light hitting it. So there's several layers to it. Um, uh, semiconductor layers and the little resistive layer on top. And the, uh, the number of photons hitting it actually affects... The resistance of the device now um, looks like in regular daylight in this room it's relatively bright in here but it's not oh here's some more light didn't even think about it there's a lot of light see and it drops even further the closer I get to this light so depending on how much light it experiences then it will have a certain resistance and it looks like ambient light is somewhere around 2,000 ohms. So, um, remember when we built, zoom out, our thermistor circuit, it was uh, regular temperature, ambient temperature, 
was around 10,000 ohms. So we put it in a voltage divider circuit with a uh, 10,000 ohm resistor. Now I don't have a 2,000 ohm resistor, um, but this thing does change. When it gets dark, it changes a lot. Um, and it goes up to, well, right now it's reading 20,000 ohms. Um, so it, it, it goes up significantly. I don't, even, I don't think it's particularly linear. Maybe in a small range it is linear. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to say that most of the time we're going to operate in daylight-ish conditions. Uh, but 10,000 is a little high for what I want. So I'm going to take another 10,000 and put it in parallel with this one. So remember when you put uh, two of the same resistors in parallel, so all I did is I just connected the same points to it. Um, when you put two of the, in this case, 10,000 ohm resistors in parallel with one another, instead of adding, they actually divide by two. So now this, the equivalent resistance is 5,000 ohms. And we will take our thermistor out. Uh, this is a photo resistor, so it doesn't have a bias to it. It doesn't matter which way you plug it in. And now i got to figure out, okay, it was going to power and to there. Um, we'll probably need to put some uh, leads on it like we did for the thermistor at some point, just so it can reach somewhere other than right here. Um, but let's build us a little Arduino sketch to to do something with this. It's nothing fancy, just uh, monitor the data uh, or the light level. Um, we won't worry with recording the light level to the SD card right now. So, let's see if I can get the Arduino IDE running. And you need to see that. There it is. This is the, actually, well, why don't we just start with this? We could record it, I guess, because this is uh, the uh, data collection for the thermistor, but I don't want to do all that. I don't want to, I don't want to get the SD card. I don't even know where I put it right now. So I'm not going to do that. We're just going to basically uh, do this part. Well, no, not even that part. This part, analog read, pin zero is all we need to do. So let's build a new one. So we do need in order to actually, well, I do want to see this on the screen. So we do need to uh, have a uh, serial begin 9600 so that we can actually see it on our serial monitor. If I don't do that, then it, it does all the reading, but it doesn't show it to me where I can see it. Um, and when I went to do serial print, then it would uh, give me an error, I think. All right, and then in our loop, oh, updates are available. We'll worry with that later. Uh, we're going to do analog read. We're still on pin zero. Um, let's say that uh, data equals that. And uh, we don't want to read it as fast as we can. Actually, let's... print out our data. I did the print line command so that it uh, prints each data point on a new line versus stringing them all together in the same line. Um, and then let's delay for maybe a uh, hundred milliseconds. See if I've got all the commands I need in there. Oh, let's save it. That's fine. I don't care. Oh, wait. What did I, for oh, there we go. I always forget, this is a problem when you're switching between different coding languages. Oh, and I do need to declare data as a variable, right? How do we do that in Arduino? Maybe an integer. Hmm, does it have to be, I guess I could do it this way. 
just declare it right there in the loop. Oh, you know what? I haven't even plugged the Arduino in. <laughs> Let's plug it in. There we go. Make sure we're on the right COM7. Spell things correctly. Oh my goodness. What am I forgetting? Oh, I don't remember. Oh, I always forget. So when you forget the commands, uh, you go to arduino.cc. And there are, let's see, where's the, I just want to see the, Oh, I have to put it in parentheses. Okay. All right, uploading. All right, so we should be able to look at our monitor. Although I like the plotter, don't I? Let's go to the plotter. All right, so there it is. It's just kind of bouncing all over the place, um, but it's not going very, actually it's going a decent way. Let's see if we can make it, there we drove it way down low. Now I've got this sine wave, right, riding on top of my actual data. So we'll have to figure out what's causing that uh, because there's, there's clearly something that's oscillating back and forth uh, that is causing something because I'm not changing the state of the photoresist. You can't see it's behind all the windows, right? Uh, but all I've got is my hand covering it up. Uh, but there's still a sine wave. So there's some kind of noise on this signal. And then I remove it and then, and then that noise is still there. Uh, so there's, there's this oscillating noise that's on our signal. Um, we'll worry with how do we get rid of noise and how do we track down what that noise is later on. Um, but you can clearly see that there's something that is giving it some other signal other than the one, one I'm interested in because the light isn't fluctuating up and down on me. Um, but it is it does respond. You know, I can cover it up and get different values, but it's got that uh, sine wave on top of it every time. And drive it even further down. Now, the, the darker it gets, the less you can see the sine wave. It's still there, but it's much less pronounced. And then the brighter it gets, the more pronounced it is. All right, anyway, it does work. Um, and that's all we need for now is to be able to see that we can get some photo data uh, having to do with the photoresistor measuring some data. Um, we'll use that for a long-term project um, to maybe record an entire day worth of data later on or something. Um, but we just need to get that set up for now. All right, back to our probability. All right, where were we? did um, just an overview of statistics and we talked about this, right? Talked about this normal distribution, looked at the histogram, um, from here on, we're pretty much just going to focus on the normal distribution. Now, there can be lots of different normal distributions depending on the, the standard deviation and where the mean is, but they're all going to have the same idea that there is a mean that's in the center of this distribution, and each side is a mirror image of the other side. It may be really stretched out like this red line or maybe bunched up like the green one, but the two sides are mirror images of one another. So that's where 
from here on out, we're going to make that assumption. Unless I say specifically that we're not making that assumption. But um, this is the, I'm running out of paper. This is the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution. So Gauss was uh, the researcher that actually created this, or I don't know if you create it, but he described it. <clears throat> um, and this is the one that you would normally call the bell curve, but like I said, there are others that have bell shapes that don't really follow this. So this line, the green one or the red one or the black one, any, any of these could be created with this equation. So it's a function of the, the mean and the data itself and standard deviation. And then P, remember that's probability, equals 1 over sigma square root of 2. You don't have to memorize this at all. So this equation, when you plug in um, uh, the mean and standard deviation, will generate one of these plots, depending on what the mean and what the standard deviation is. <clears throat> so there is an actual equation um, that we can use. Now, we're not going to use this equation because what you would need to do with this equation, let's say that you put in a, a mean of, uh, I don't know, 10, and a standard deviation of 2. So you put in 10 and 2 into this equation, you would get a plot that looks something like this, where the mean we said was 10, so this would be 10. Standard deviation was 2, so 2. So this would be 12, 14, 16. So I'm adding a standard deviation each time. 8. 6, 4, I'm subtracting one standard deviation each time. And pretty much when you go out four standard deviations, I didn't hit it quite so well over here, you've gotten all of the data. Now you never, um, it, it's one of those things that never actually gets to zero. So um, you could keep going, but uh, three standard deviations gives you something like 90, I don't remember the number, 98% uh, of the data and four standard deviations is 99% or whatever. We, we can look it up later. Um, but um, what I want, to, what this equation would be graphing this line. And a lot of times what I want to know is the area under this curve is one. So the total area under the curve is one. There's the probability, remember this is a probability. So the probability that something is going to occur is one and a lot of times what I want to do is figure out well what's the probability that um, I this is this data represents something that I'm collecting and I'm measuring it and it you know it ranges kind of from 4 to 16 what's the probability that the next one I measure is going to be 8 or less so I would need to integrate the area from negative infinity to 8 so I'd have to integrate this thing from negative infinity to 8 um, possible, you know, maybe even I put it in MathCAD and there's uh, Python programs that will do this, uh, but I'm not going to do it by hand. So instead, there are charts that, let me see if I can get a chart for you to look at. I don't know if I can get the whole chart on the screen, but here's a bit of the chart. Now this one's showing a different range, right? It's going from the the center over to some data point, this shaded part. Um, so there are a lot of charts that look like this, right? And uh, they have a picture that goes with them to show you what area they are calculating. And um, in, in my case, I wanted the area from negative infinity, uh, the area of the left tail. So negative infinity up to some point. Um, the chart that I have a picture of here is given me from the center so from the mean over to some point. So I would have to manipulate what I've got over here 
to match the chart, but there's different charts. So where, every time you're using one of these charts, be, be sure that you're using uh, the correct chart, uh, that you have one that actually uh, is giving you the same pattern or the same shaded area, the same integral uh, that you're actually trying to calculate um, because they, are, they would give you different numbers. So let's look at the chart again. So here, you notice that first of all, this says Z, we haven't even talked about Z. So you could imagine that since this function is a function of mean and standard deviation, that I could put lots of different values in for mean and standard deviation and generate infinitely many graphs or plots or distributions. Um, and there aren't gonna be infinitely many charts. I mean, that would be a, a huge waste of space. So instead, what it does is it normalizes these charts, normalize the standard distribution, the normal distribution, uh, so that you only have one chart, or you might have multiple charts, some that have different areas shaded in, um, but uh, one chart that represents all of the values that you could put in for sigma and mu. So how we're gonna do that is we need to do a transform. So we need to figure out our Z value. So Z, the Z that's gonna go in the chart we're gonna use is equal to X. So in this case, eight might be X because that's the data point I'm interested in. Minus mu over sigma. So for our set of data, uh, Z would be X is eight minus mu is 10 over sigma is two. Uh, so it just equals one, right? Technically it's negative one, eight minus 10 is negative two over two. Um, but there's no, in our charts, there are no negative numbers. So we have to use the symmetry of the, uh, symmetry of the chart to give us information. Now, our chart, let's look at the picture here. Our chart is actually going to give us this area right here. Right? Because that's what the picture shows. It says shows it's going to measure from the uh, median or the mean, not the median, the mean over to Z, whatever Z happens to be. So it's going to give us this value. We wanted this value. So we're going to have to figure out um, and use the symmetry of the chart to figure this out. So this red area that I shaded is what the chart's going to give us. But since this side is a mirror image of this side, this red area is this area. We'll make it a different color. So red and blue are the same area under the curve. Red is what we'll get from the chart. If I know blue, then I know one other thing also, and, and maybe this isn't obvious, but remember the entire area. So if I integrate this guy uh, from negative infinity to positive infinity, you know, go as far out in e both directions as I can go, then P equals one. The area under the entire curve is one. So this dotted line, that's my uh, mu, is right in the middle of that. And so this side, the area under this side is 0.5, right? So it's 50% of one. And the area on this side is also 0.5. So it's saying that there's an equal chance that a number is gonna be above the mean and an equal chance that it's gonna be below the mean. And this area from, in my case, 10 to negative infinity is 0.5. So if I know that from here to ne negative infinity is 0.5, and I can calculate this red area, which equals the blue area, then the green is 0.5 minus the blue, right? So that's what we're gonna do. So we have a Z value of one. So we have to go to our chart. And uh, so the way the chart works is the, the numbers in the middle of the chart, those are the areas in decimal form. Um, and then Z starts on the uh, left column. So there's one, and then you find the decimal. So I could have 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and so forth. 
Um, and so I'll read, for me, I have 1.0, so this number right here, 0. 0.3413. So the, air, the red area is 0. 0.3413. So that came from the chart. By sym symmetry, I know that the red and the blue are the same thing. And I know that green is 0.5, so that's from negative infinity to the mean, minus 0 0.3413 equals, I don't know, let's see. 0.5 minus 0 0.3413, 0 0.1587. So uh, let's just call it 15.9%. So what this would say, if I had a set of data that had a mean of 10, a standard deviation of 2, and I wanted to know the probability or the percent chance that a data point was going to be eight or smaller, it would be about 16%. There's a 16% chance that data is going to be eight or smaller. Whatever it is I'm measuring, it's going to be eight or smaller. Um, and so that's where we can start to begin to use this in a measurement kind of way where we can assume if our data really is normally distributed. So we've We've taken some sample data, we put it into a histogram, and it looks like a relatively normal distribution. It's not skewed, it doesn't have two humps in it, it doesn't, it's not inverted or some weird thing. Um, then we can begin to use the, um, the probability function, uh, transform it with our Z variable to standardize it so we can use a chart, and then figure out how we're going to use that chart to, to parse out the piece of information that we're interested in. Um, and a lot of times you have to use symmetry. You have to use the idea that the area under the entire curve is 1. The area under half of the curve is 0.5. And if you can get those three things, symmetry, entire curve is 1, the half curve is 0.5, then any one of the charts that are out there should be able to you to, to be used to help you figure out what you're trying to do. Um, for instance, let's say that we want to do the same thing, but we wanted to know the probability that um, we were going to find um, well, that's smaller than 12. So we want to know anything from 12 over. We do the same thing and um, we would go 12 minus 10 is 2 over 2, which is 1. So we end up with the same z value. We look at the same number here, 0.3413. That is the number from the mean over to 12, where we wanted to find it. And um, we add all of the other side to it. So 0.5 plus 343. So the probability that our data is equal to or smaller than 12 would be 0.8413. So almost 84 or, or over 84%, right? Um, so you can combine the idea of half the curve is 0.5, the entire curve is 1. We could figure out this part by doing 0.5 minus this one would give us this curve. That's basically the same thing that we did for the green. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can combine it together. Uh, let's see, if, what else do I want to talk about? Uh, we can do this in Python. I don't want to go through Python right now and do that. Um, we'll probably come back to that just so we can walk through the code of how it works in Python. The, the write-up has Python code that you can program through and kind of see some of these different things. Um, oh, there's one thing I wanted to show, I guess. One thing. Um, so we did this one. We plotted or we drew uh, different standard deviations, but the same mean. Just so we're clear, if we have maybe the same standard deviation but different means, then it would basically just, you know, here's one mean. 
And same standard deviation would be the same shape, but a new mean. And, you know, another one, same standard deviation, but a different mean. So the mean is shifting it along your number line, and the standard deviation is spreading or contracting the data around the mean. So just to make sure that that's clear. Um, and then Z standardizes it to where actually, if you look at the plot of Z, this would be one, standard deviation and mean would be one. Um, all right, like I said, I don't wanna do the Python code right now. Um, we'll come back to that later. I think what I wanna do now is I wanna talk a little bit about the, uh, st uh, the student distribution. I don't know that I wanna do anything with it. Maybe we will, because it, it is confusing in that it looks like the charts that you use for the uh, normal distribution, except that there you use it backwards almost. So if you watch that podcast about Guinness, you kind of got the idea of why it's called student distribution that um, uh, Gossett was the guy's name and he worked for Guinness and um, he had figured this out. He wasn't necessarily, I don't know what his, maybe he was a chemist because he worked in their, you know, uh, brewery, brewery. So I don't know his actual background. But anyway, um, he worked there and he figured out how he could um, do things like what we just did with the probability, but on smaller sample sizes. So notice here, I've got uh, population mean and population standard deviation. So I've got large data sets behind this one. But when you have smaller data sets, then things aren't as simple. And um, he, wanted to, he wanted to have the same kind of uh, certainty that he was actually detecting a difference between product A and product B. Um, and so you don't have as many samples. And so he developed this distribution. His name's Student because Guinness didn't want him to use his name to publish the information because then his uh, Guinness's competitors could go in and uh, track down that guy's name and like, wait a minute, then they're doing this, then, then it makes sense now and we can do the same thing. So they thought they had a competitive advantage um, if he did not publish it under his name. And instead he chose, I don't know why he chose, but he chose the student distribution. So um, a couple of things about it. It has this idea of degrees of freedom, which we touched on a little bit ago when I talked about N minus one. Uh, so there is a degrees of freedom where it is n minus one. Um, and so it's the number of samples you have and you subtract one. So if you took 30 measurements, it's degrees of freedom is 29. It has a similar, well, I don't even know if it's similar looking. It has a function like this one to generate the curve. Um, it has obviously degrees of freedom in there. It has the gamma function. Uh, which is x minus 1 factorial. So it has the um, same idea anyway. It has a function that generates the curve. The idea for this is that um, you want to, a lot of times, what you use in the student distribution is, for one, you have a small sample size, so you can't really uh, get the same level of confidence that you have if you have a large sample size. And... Uh, so we have a small sample set and let's show a chart here So this it looks very similar now the shaded area is a little bit different, right? There's only one tail is shaded where we had the mean over to a area Covered um, so a little bit different there, but and there's that V. This is degrees of freedom V um, And so it goes one down to I don't know this one goes to 35 and then it skips to infinity so if you put infinity in here for the degrees of freedom, you pretty much are just back at this, this guy, when you have large sample sizes. But this is when you have smaller sample sizes. So this one goes up to 35, well, a sample size of 36, I guess, because this is degrees of freedom. Um, but on the top, you don't have the rest of the, uh, remember how Z, we had part of the Z number on the, uh, left column in the the tenth or the hundredths place of the z in the uh, 
uh, row, row, top row. Um, this is different. This is called alpha over two. So this is your level of significance. Alpha is your level of significance. Alpha over two is just saying, saying that this particular chart is only using uh, one tail of the um, distribution. So if it was alpha, both of these tails would be shaded in. The, the left-hand side would be shaded in and the right-hand side would be shaded in mirror images of one another. And that would be two tails. But this is alpha over two, so it's only one tail. So the level of significance is how certain can you be, um, it's, a, it's a measure of how certain you can be that this thing is true. Whatever it is you're measuring or testing is true. A lot of times you'll use it to say that two means are different from one another. You're, you, know, you have a level of significance of 0.05 that these two means are not the same, that they are statistically different. And so you'll, you'll hear that, you'll hear level of significance, you'll hear statistically different, um, things like that. It, and with small sample sizes, it brings you to the student distribution. All right, so how might we use this chart? Let's find what's called maybe the, well, let's just look at the chart first and just do that. Oh, I'm running out of paper. Let me find a blank sheet of paper. There's kind of one. All right. So if we had a number of data points, 25. So, or, well, I guess it's not, that's probably not a population, so we should probably make that a lowercase n. And uh, the t value, so the t value is the number we get from the t distribution or this, um, it's sometimes called the student t or the student distribution or the t distribution. So a lot of different things that it might all be the same thing. So t value is the number in the chart that we were just looking at. So t uh, equals, we don't know, alpha uh, or the, the level of significance equals 0 0.05. So how do we find t if we know that we had 25 data points and we have a alpha of 0.05? All right, so let's go to our chart and see if we can figure this out. So um, if we had 25 data points, that means our degrees of freedom, I'm writing V, so degrees of freedom equals 25 minus one, so that's 24. So we go to the 24 line, and then we have all these numbers to choose from. We had a alpha level of significance of 0.05. So here's where um, it seems really simple, but you tend to forget there's a 0.05 right there but this is alpha over 2 so instead of uh, the 0.05 you actually want to use the 0 0.025 uh, because alpha itself is 0.05 but the numbers here are alpha over 2 so I have to divide by 2 0.05 divided by 2 is 0 0.025 so don't forget that most of these student T charts are going to have alpha over two so only one tail shown um, you might find a chart that has two tails and it just shows alpha um, in that case the the chart the picture of the chart would have uh, both the left and right tail shaded in but most of them are going to show just alpha over two so 0 0.025 is kind of the middle column here and i want 24 data points so therefore t the t value is two 0.064. So there's now the t value by itself doesn't necessarily mean anything to you, but um, that is how we would find the t value. Um, to use that to do something, uh, we'll do that later. Um, I just wanted to get the idea of the the chart and how it's different from the normal distribution chart. Um, I don't want to get too far into this. I think next time what we'll do is we will do some more of these samples. Well, actually next time you have an exam. 
So uh, we won't do anything on Thursday. Thursday, you have an exam. Um, you'll be in Moodle. You will come log in at 8 o'clock. The exam opens up. Um, I'll give you a Zoom room. I'll write all this out too so you don't have to try and copy it down right now. But I'll give you a Zoom room lo uh, location. You'll log into that, log into Moodle, take the exam. It's only 75 minutes, so um, it doesn't take the entire time that we normally have. Uh, and it'll grade it automatically. Now, I'll usually have to go in and do modifications, maybe uh, change some point distributions, or maybe I type something, you know, coded the wrong answer in or whatever. Um, so the grade that it tells you right away won't necessarily be the final grade. It's just it's first pass through the grading. Um, also, I think there's one question I have to manually grade, like you type in a open response, so it can't grade that. Um, but uh, that'll start tomorrow, uh, Thursday, 8 o'clock. Um, it stays open for, well, once you start taking it, it stays open for 75 minutes. Um, there'll also be, there are some workout problems, like not like this, um, but workout for things that we have done in the past. None of this, none of the stuff we talked about today is on exam one. Um, this is all on exam two. That's why I don't want to do too much of it today because we have to do exam one and then come back to this. Um, if you have a workout problem, write your hand workout and um, there'll be a place to upload a scan. It, uh, the scan just can be a, you take a picture of it on your phone and upload those to the uh, Moodle page where it says to upload your scanned work here. Um, and uh, you can ask questions in the Zoom room or in Discord, whichever. Um, you have one formula sheet that uh, is shown. You can download that thing. I, well, it's in Moodle. Um, what is it called? Let me make sure I know the name of it so I tell you the right thing. It is called, if you look on October 8th, it's called Exam 1 Formula Sheet. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can have that sheet for formulas. Um, there's also exam one outline that kind of shows you the um, list of topics that will be on the exam. Uh, there are some that are, there are actually quite a few that are just content related. So you don't calculate anything. You just answer a question. And then there's seven or so that are calculation type things. But some of those are really simple calculations. We haven't done any calculations that are really complicated. You don't have to do any coding. Um, you do have to decipher code. So there's some blocks of code. You have to tell what it does kind of thing. Um, yeah, look at the outline. Uh, look at the formula sheet. The formula sheet does have some formulas that will be on exam two. So if there's stuff on there that doesn't make sense yet or it's stuff we just talked about with the Z score or something like that, then um, don't worry about those. They're just in there for the next exam. All right. I think that's a good stopping point. What you need to be working on is getting exam one ready. Um, turn in homework three soon. Um, there'll be some homework related to this distribution stuff, but I'm not going to worry with that yet. That'll be after the exam. Um, we do have a project starting. So the, the big term project, you do need to start figuring out how uh, can you get a team together? So a lot of you are on campus. You can, um, you know, work there. If you're not on campus, then we need to figure out how your team looks or, or do you even want to have a team? Maybe you just do it on your own. Um, you, the ideal situation is you have four people on a team. You choose a sensor, either one that is in your package or one that you all have or one that you all buy, whichever version you want. I'm not going to be too particular in this situation just because it's kind of difficult to control all that stuff um, and the four of you implement that sensor to measure the same thing and that way we have four sets four entire sets of data of whatever it is you're going to measure there's a write-up that uh, i'll post i think i already did post it actually on today's yeah it's called project introduction um, and so there's a whole write-up about the things that you might uh, consider with this but the ideal situation is there's four of you and uh, you all have the same sensor you implement it four different times and you record this data and then we do some analysis. So maybe some of the stuff that we've done here with probability, some stuff we'll do in the future with uncertainty, um, things like that. 
Um, but we wanted to go ahead and introduce the project so that you can get your team organized um, and that you can, if you wanted to round up different sensors than what you already have, you can find those uh, and make sure that they're working and things like that. Uh, the project itself is not due until the very end of the quarter. So the last um, two days of the quarter, we have project presentations, which I assume we'll do in Zoom. Um, I think that's enough information for now. Um, go and read the different introduction distribution, normal distribution, student distribution, the, the write-ups that they're there because there are in pieces of information in there that I didn't spell out. Um, and there's Python code. We'll go back over the Python code after the exam on how those work. Um, the photoresistor is also in there. You know, we did that. It's plug it in where you had the thermistor and um, we do need to figure out where it's getting its interference from. Maybe it's uh, some noise from some, I've got all kinds of electronics around here, so maybe it's some of that noise. Um, and it's not shielded at all, it's just sticking up here. Um, so, but go ahead and get your photoresistor, make sure it works. And uh, I, will, I will see you actually on Thursday in a Zoom as you take the test. So I'll put up the link to that um, Thursday morning. You can start the exam. Uh, it should be scored later that day so you know what the score is. And uh, let me know if you have questions. I'll see you all on Thursday.